So hi, Hilash, good afternoon. And welcome to the Future of African Family Business, hosted by African Family Firms. It's great to have you. Thank you, yeah, it's great to be here. So over to you with your presentation. Great, yeah, so we're talking about um, pre-arrival UK tax planning. Um, and it's really about, you know, how you're going to get caught in the UK tax there. I mean, why, why bother thinking about this? Um, if you have or are thinking of having UK connections such as um, coming into the UK, spending a bit more time um, making investments, you know, the UK is and continues to be, you know, a popular place to you maybe know, looking to diversify your assets, um, looking to new markets, you know, spending a bit more time, you and your family, education, etc. It is really popular. Um, you know, you should really be thinking um, about the various particular tax aspects because they are complicated. You might think, well, you know, it makes complete sense. If I'm, you know, in the UK, I'll be taxed on my um, UK assets and what's happening in the UK, everything else won't be subject to UK tax. Uh, or, you know, if I've invested in the UK, that's it. That's the only thing that will be subject to UK tax. Unfortunately, that is definitely not the case. The UK has a really um, complex and sophisticated tax regime, um, which can really get you tied up into knots without um, proper advice and planning. And then in that case, you're thinking, well, why bother? I'm not going to touch the UK with a barge pole. Um, I'm going to definitely stay clear. Or actually, look, I really want to be in the UK, so I'm going to just have to pay the, the high amount of tax. There's nothing that can be done. Again, that's not the case. Um, actually, it, you know, it's much more nuanced and complicated than that. The UK has a really favourable uh, regime of taxation for individual individ uh, individuals um, internationally. So in this session, I really want to raise awareness of the various aspects and issues relating to UK taxation for international individuals and also um, what planning that could be done so that at least if you have or are going to have UK connections, you are aware of what you might need to seek advice about and what planning might need to be done so that you can have uh, an efficient um, uh, you can have efficient arrangements, but also get better returns on your investments. What I'm going to cover today, um, it's going to be how the UK taxes individuals. I think that will just be really useful, uh, fundamental um, understanding of that and really a set up understanding how the UK taxes non-UK assets. I think that's sort of really key and a lot of people are really surprised that this can happen, but it very much is the case. And then I'll look at some tax planning points, you know, how we can look to using the favourable regime of taxation for uh, international individuals. First of all, how does the UK tax individuals? We look at UK tax residents. If you're a UK tax resident, you are subject to um, income tax and capital gains tax on your worldwide income and gains. So that's worldwide, not just in the UK, um, anywhere in the world. If you are not a UK resident, you are only subject to um, income tax and capital gains tax on your UK assets. So that makes sense. Everything that's um, outside of the UK isn't taxed um, in the UK. Um, domicile, you may well have heard of domicile and people talking quite a lot about this. Um, a lot of people, I'd say most people get confused about what domicile is it's not the same thing as tax residence. People do confuse it. It's actually a very distinct separate concept under English law. So what is it? Domicile isn't about where you live. It's really about where you feel your home is. It's where you have connections to, you know, where you'd like to uh, retire, where you'd like to live. Um, and sadly, there isn't sort of a tick box exercise of, OK, if I fulfill this criteria, that means I'm UK domiciled or I'm not UK domiciled. But in essence, it's kind of um, where you feel your home is. And what's this relevant to? This is a relevant inheritance tax, which uh, is important because if you are domiciled in the UK, um, you are subject to inheritance tax on your worldwide assets. And that is really, really significant particularly given 
UK inheritance tax is 40%. So that's huge. If you're not UK double sold, you're only subject to inheritance tax on your UK assets. So let's, that's just kind of a real basic um, foundation of how the UK taxes individuals. Let's look a bit more detail about the taxation of non-UK assets. So as I said before, if you're a UK resident, you're subject to income tax and capital gains tax um, on a worldwide basis. So what does UK resident actually mean? Now, we have a test that's set out, set out in statutes. Uh, and it, it's really not as simple as, oh, I spend X number of days in the UK, therefore I am UK resident. And if I don't spend that many days, I'm not. Sadly, it, it really isn't that simple. There are, to begin with, if you satisfy an automatic test, you can either automatically be UK resident or automatically non-UK resident. So you're automatically resident if you have full-time employment in the UK, for example, or your only home is in the UK. Uh, you may be automatically uh, UK non-resident if you spend less than 16 days in the UK. Um, but most people will not fall in one of those categories then we get to the more complicated situation where you have to look at the number of connecting factors that you have. The more connecting factors that you have, the less time you can spend in the UK before you are UK resident. So depending on the number of connecting factors you have, you can become resident by spending as little as 46 days in the UK, or if you have the least number of connecting factors, you can you you only become UK resident when you spend 121 days in the UK. So that's a huge difference there, and it's really important to understand um, the number of connecting factors and also the number of days that you can spend in the UK before becoming UK resident it depends on whether you've been UK resident in previous tax years. Just to add to the complications here, when I'm talking about connecting factors, I mean. It, it includes things like having somewhere available to live in the UK. It doesn't mean you necessarily own something in the UK. It just has to be available to you. It could be, um, you know, a rental property that you have. It could be um, staying with friends or family. Um, it could, you know, another connecting factor is if you have family over in the UK um, or you spent a certain number of days in previous years in the UK as well. That can count as well. One of the key issues I think people don't realise and has a really big impact is that if you come part way through a tax year and in the UK a tax year begins on the 6th of April and ends the following year on the 5th of April. If you come part way through a tax year you're, you're normally deemed to be UK resident for a whole tax year. Which means, so for example, um, if you came in October this year um, and you satisfied all the tests and became UK tax resident in the tax year 2021-2022, that would actually mean your UK resident deemed to be UK resident for the period from the 5th of April, which is uh, which has huge significance. As I said, if you're a UK resident, you're subject to income and gains on a worldwide basis. So if you have any income or gains, before October, that can be subject to UK taxes. However, there are, you can claim split year treatment in sort of very specific circumstances, which mean that you're only um, treated as being UK resident for the time you were actually here, i.e. from October, for example. But again, that's, it's really important that um, these rules are complicated and you get that advice and you get it in good time. As I said, you could be UK tax resident for a whole tax year. So you, you're going to have to plan, you know, ideally a year in advance of you coming into the UK to make sure, um, you know, you're taking into account the fact that the UK tax year begins on the 6th of April. So as I said, you are, if you're a UK resident, you're subject to income um, and gains on a worldwide uh, basis. So what does that mean? So income are subject to UK taxes. This can include um, a salary. Um, say you're, you're receiving um, a salary in uh, from one of your um, uh, companies um, based out in Kenya, for example. Um, you have another, you know, a company um, 
doing business activity in South Africa, for instance, uh, any dividends out of there, they'll be um, subject to UK taxes. Even if um, you don't bring them into the UK, they'll still be subject to UK taxes. And if you have established a, a, a trust, say in Mauritius or Jersey or somewhere, for asset protection purposes, which is, you know, a lot of people do and, you know, is really valuable, particularly in Africa for um, protecting those assets from uh, business risk, from uh, political risk, and really having that uh, from family risk, from uh, preserving that for, for a future generation. Um, if you are the person who provides that money, who settled that money onto trust and you're, you're a beneficiary, you could be subject to any income within uh, that trust as it, as it arises. Um, so for example, if this trust had um, a, a portfolio of assets and there's dividends being paid out to the trust, um, you could be subject to uh, tax on that. Even though you don't receive them, you're just the person who's uh, put the money in. Uh, if you had, uh, if within that trust there was a company, for example, and obviously it's a trading company that is, uh, is producing income, um, even though even if the trust doesn't get that, the you could be subject to tax, and that is really wide ranging. There's lots of anti-avoidance rules which can mean that that is subject to UK tax on you as a settler. Say, and for example, say you didn't settle a trust. Um, but you're just a beneficiary, any distributions to you of the income, again, will be subject to you, even if you don't bring them into the UK. Again, all of this is um, it, the subject to UK tax, even if you don't bring it into the UK. Um, capital gains tax, let's, how does that work? So you have any gains um, that are realised by you. Uh, for example, you sell a property um, that you're living in in Ghana. That is, uh, there's a gain on that, you are subject to UK tax on that. If you have um, some other um, assets that are um, in, in Africa as well, yeah, they're subject to UK tax. But you're also subject to capital gains tax if you, for example, have a company um, where you and a business partner are the directors, you're also um, the only shareholders. Now um, you decide to, it's, it's a manufacturing company and you decide to um, sell um, some of the plant and machinery, for example, and there's gains on that. You'll be, um, it's obviously the company that has disposed of this and the company makes that gain. But because it's a small closed company, again, anti-avoidance rules mean that that again is um, as if it's yours, it's deemed to be yours and subject to UK tax again. So as I said, it's really um, wide ranging and um, can get into everything. There's, you know, there's lots of weird and tricky provisions and often ones that don't really follow any logic. I think a lot of people are trying to find logic in the UK tax system. Sadly, often there isn't. These things have just um, year by year, you know, it's a bit of a cat and mouse game that our tax authorities play, um, trying to close loopholes or trying to, to get more taxes. So we've got obviously um, your UK resident, you are subject to income tax and capital gains tax on worldwide assets. Now you might also be subject to income tax and capital gains tax on um, those income and gains in the country where they arose. Now, normally, um, the UK does have a good set of double um, taxation treaties, which basically aim to um, take away the double taxation element on, on the same you know, income or the same gains. And they normally work by saying, OK, we'll give one country the, the primary taxing rights, say, look, they're going to tax it. And if there's tax in another country that might arise, um, we'll just credit that tax. The problem is, um, if the UK has a higher tax rate than, um, you know, the country where the asset was, for example, um, there's, you know, there's some um, 
a, a farm in Uganda and that has you've sold that that's um, subject to capital gains tax if now the rate of tax in the UK is higher than Uganda you'll end up paying the, the UK rate you'll pay the higher rate um, so it, it can help to some extent but you know you will be paying the higher rates sometimes just because of the quirk of things and the way the complex UK tax system works is there will be UK taxes to pay on certain transactions uh, or transfers but there might not be any tax um, in the home jurisdiction where the assets are. Uh, what that means is you, you end up paying tax, you, you can't claim a double tax treaty, you end up paying tax on that um, in the UK um, and in and, and that's it, you can't use any double tax treaty. Let's move on to UK domicile. So um, there are only very few um, double tax treaties for death taxes. So if you're subject to um, UK uh, inheritance tax on a worldwide basis on all of your assets, if there are inheritance taxes elsewhere, you know, it's unlikely you're going to be able to um, claim a double tax treaty and you're going to be taxed twice on that. And as I said, 40% uh, inheritance tax is really high. Now, this all does sound very, very <laughs> doom and gloom, doesn't it? Um, and you think, well, uh, you know, this seems very high rates of taxation. Um, they're going to try and tax everything. What is the point um, of, of having any connections to the UK? However, the UK does have a favourable um, regime of taxation for individuals um, with an international connection. And so much so, actually, there's some other jurisdictions, including, say, Italy, in two or three years ago, trying to replicate how the UK does tax them. So the, the, the base of taxation that I sort of have described, where if you are a UK resident, you are subject to um, income tax and capital gains tax on an, uh, on your worldwide assets as they arise. It's called the arising basis, and that's the default. However, if you are UK domiciled, sorry, if you're a UK resident, but not UK domiciled, you can claim the remittance basis of taxation. What's this? So where you're subject to um, income tax and capital gains tax on your UK assets, that's not controversial. For any income or gains that arise outside of the UK, you're not subject to um, capital gains tax and income tax on that. Now, that's that's pretty good because I just said, if you're a UK resident, you're subject to tax on a worldwide basis. Here we're saying, if you're a UK resident, you're only subject to tax income and capital gains tax on your UK assets and not subject to income tax and capital gains tax on your non-UK assets. You're only subject to tax on those non-UK assets if they arose while you were a UK resident and you brought them into the UK. So that's what we're saying when you remit to them into the UK. The remittance basis is free to use for the first seven years. So it's, you know, it makes sense to be doing that to begin with. Um, after that, um, after seven years, you pay £30,000 a year to be able to claim the remittance basis. And after 12 years, you, you pay £60,000 a year to claim the remittance basis. And after 15 years, you can't claim it at all. So before those time periods, is, there needs to be some planning involved and thought about whether you claim it and, and arranging your affairs generally. Um, but it, particularly for the first seven years, it's, it's really useful. And so, as I said, if you are a UK resident and not domiciled, you pay income tax, capital gains tax on your UK assets. Those outside of the UK won't be subject to tax unless you remit them, i.e. bring them into the UK. But you have to remember remit has a wide meaning. It's not just you bringing in your, um, say, you know, proceeds from your dividends from your South African company into um, the UK. It also covers, say, you gave, gave that money to your wife or your husband and they bring it and use it in the UK, that's also covered. Or um, say you 
uh, pay for service, say you have a service in the UK, say my fee, um, I'll be providing that, those services in the UK. If you use um, the proceeds of uh, the gains from your Ugandan farm, if you use that to pay my fees, again, that's a remittance and you'll pay capital gains tax on the bit that you bring into the UK to pay my fees. Um, another bit that another area that I think people often get caught out in is um, servicing loans, paying debt, that is UK site of debt. For example, if you have a mortgage on a UK property, or actually you have um, a loan from um, an, an African bank um, and you're liaising with them out of um, out of uh, out of Accra, um, but actually it's um, but the collateral is on um, some UK assets. That if you then use um, some income or gains um, outside of the UK to pay that debt, that's actually a remittance because that's deemed to be a UK uh, debt, and you're you're then satisfying that. So it's really important you understand also what a remittance is. I'm going to give special mention to UK property because it is such um, a popular asset class, um, has been and will continue to be for international investors, uh, particularly from Africa, I find as well. And um, the rules in recent years have really changed. So you might hear people um, saying, oh yeah, just buy it through an offshore, buy your property through an offshore company that works. Now, the rules have changed really quite significantly in the past six or seven years, which means that that isn't necessarily the case. So, you know, for example, uh, with residential property, there's um, where you buy, uh, where you already have another property and you buy an additional one, you pay extra 3% SDLT. If you're a non-UK buyer, you pay additional 2% SDLT. If you buy a property through a company, um, you pay an extra, um, there's a higher rate of SDLT, which is a, a stamp duty land tax when you purchase properties. Um, there's an annual tax as well, where you buy through a property, you have to pay that every year. Uh, and also with residential property, where you owned residential property through an offshore company, basically you took that as the inheritance tax now. However, for residential property, now that doesn't work. That will be subject to UK taxes. And before, where a non-resident owned UK property, whether um, it's because you weren't resident or it was owned by an offshore company, which isn't you know, UK resident and it disposed of it, there wouldn't be any capital gains tax. However, there is now. So that's really been some quite significant changes there. Um, and then, you know, there we have commercial property and that's treated differently. Um, we don't have a lot of these restrictions. Um, the change has been, you know, the capital gains tax, it will always be subject to that. Um, but for example, if you own it through an offshore company, that is a good way of taking it out of the UK inheritance tax there. So as you can see, it's quite complicated. So now I've kind of highlighted um, the ways in which the UK tries to um, tax non-UK assets and also the really favourable regime, the, the remittance basis of taxation. Now, how can we use that for our planning to make things efficient? If you, so if you're spending more time in the UK, it's really important to know if and when you will become UK tax assistance. There's no point just assuming, oh, I haven't spent 183 days in the UK, therefore I will not be UK tax assistance. As I said, you can spend much, much less time there, you know, anywhere between um, 46 and 120 days and become UK tax residents. Um, so you don't want to become tax residents by mistake because then you can't do any planning beforehand. And as I said, UK tax residents usually is for a whole tax year. So um, we need to make sure you're understanding and we're planning for that. Another really important part of planning is clean capital planning. And this is taking advantage of the remittance basis of taxation. What does this mean? So here we set up a pot of money, clean capital. And that is before you come to the UK. And that's really important that it's before you become a UK resident. Now you set that up, you put that money in there. And this account has to be operated in a really quite a specific way. Um, and I work really closely with um, clients, banks, 
an investment manager to make sure they understand it and do it correctly. Um, but we operate that correctly, which means that once you become a UK resident, you can use that money from that pot, even while you were a UK resident, and not pay any UK taxes on that. Now, this is really useful for if you're coming to the UK, you can set up uh, the sum of money which, you're going, which is going to fund your UK lifestyle, rather than using other income and gains that arise while you're a UK resident. Because those, that income and gains that arise while you're a UK resident, if you bring that into the UK, will be subject to UK tax. But if you use this money in this clean capital account, that won't be subject to UK tax. And the, the other income and gains that have arisen due, during a UK residence, which might be subject to, you know, if you brought them into the UK, would be subject to UK tax. You leave that offshore, you leave that outside of the UK, and that won't be subject to tax. If you then become non-UK resident and you leave, you can then use that income and gains that has arisen outside of the UK. Um, but during your UK residence, and that, that won't be subject to UK tax. So that, that's really powerful, it's really quite useful. And I think another really important point is to review the structures. I talked about um, your, you know, your companies, potentially any gains within them being subject to UK taxes if it's a, a closely small company. Um, if you have trusts, I said, if you are a settler and a beneficiary, you could be subject to income tax and capital gains tax as it arises in the trust and its underlying assets. So it's really important to um, understand and look at your offshore structures in which you're connected to, to see whether um, the income and gains could be subject to tax and make sure we're just arranging the affairs properly in that. Um, so planning for investing in the UK. As I said, um, the rules are quite complex and uh, quite fragmented. Uh, the IHG treatment, inheritance tax treatment, and capital gains tax treatments really significantly changed. You need to um, consider the the tax um, structure that you use. Before, everyone just used to hold UK property through offshore companies, and by and large, that generally worked. It was the most efficient. That's not necessarily the case, um, and it really depends on what you're looking to do. So you have to consider whether you want to hold the, the, the property personally or through a company or whether you hold some properties personally and some properties through a company. It really all depends on whether it's residential property, whether you're going to use a property or rent it out, um, whether it's commercial property, whether there's lending on the property and the value of the property. So there's lots of different aspects to think about. Finally, I, I mean, I don't think I can, um, you know, at the moment, uh, go without speaking about COVID. Now there's quite a few people who've been stuck in the UK and they've become inadvertently UK residents. Now there's some tax handling you can't do when you become UK resident but there's still some things that you can do. Um, and But what I would say is frustratingly our tax authorities, HMRC, haven't been very lenient about the fact that people are stuck in here. They've, they've taken a really hard line so that's frustrating. Um, and, and which will mean that a lot of people have become UK tax resident in this year, you know, without wanting to or realising, and perhaps will be tax resident next year as we still have, you know, travel bans here in the UK and elsewhere. So in summary, um, hopefully in this session you'll have understood how the UK um, taxes people, um, how non-UK assets can be subject to UK taxes um, quite easily uh, and you know and also spoken a bit about property as it is popular and needs careful thoughts as well but despite all of this I, I hope I've given you an understanding that the UK does have a favourable regime and with the expert advice and planning put into place, particularly before you come to the UK or, or are investing in the UK, um, as international individuals, uh, there can be really efficient ways of doing it to really get the most out of um, your assets. So yeah, thank you very much. I hope that was useful. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Hilesh. Um, we really enjoyed listening to that, especially getting to know the ins and outs of um, taxation from 
a UK point of view, especially if you want to get into the UK in any format whatsoever. The first question that we have is for those that are seeking to move and set up their businesses in the UK, what should they be thinking about? Yeah, that's um, a really important uh, consideration. I think it's if you're looking to uh, set up your business in the UK, I think, first of all, let's look at how much time you're spending in the UK. Just don't assume by spending, oh, I'm only spending 60 days in the UK to and froing um, that I'm not going to be UK resident. Let's just have a think about that. Um, I think because that will have a massive impact on your, the, the personal taxation there. On the other aspect of, of your business, I think it's important um, how you're funding that. Um, as I said, it's important to then um, think about if, if it's a UK company, how that will be taxed. And also consider whether it's going to be a subsidiary or not, whether you're going to bring then those you know, non-UK subsidiaries into the, the scope of UK tax as well. So just being careful about having those UK connections. Thank you, Hirosh. Um, we have another question. What tips do you have for those that are seeking to have more tax efficient structures? Um, yeah, so I think if you're investing in the UK, as I said, with property, it's important to review those structures because the tax rules changed really quite significantly and quickly um, over the previous year. So having a look at those, you, as I said, there's annual taxes on properties held through uh, companies. So people often don't even realise this. So it's making sure you're reviewing that and looking at that carefully. Um, and um, if you have other uh, assets as well, I think it's, again, the taxation rules have changed quite a lot here in the UK. So just making sure you're reviewing that and particularly things that are held through quite complicated structures, which might have worked previously through various companies and things like that, that often doesn't work anymore. And quite and, and gen, the general trend I'm finding, and, and I would advocate for people is, let's keep things as simple as possible. That's not to say we don't plan um, matters and have structures in place, but I mean, there needs to be a really compelling reason to have that uh, in place because with all of these structures, you, you, there's added cost to them. It's you know added layers of companies and directors and accountants fees and you know solicitors fees and tax advisors fees. You know we, you need to be thinking about all of those things. Definitely, and what's been the prognosis for the UK in light of Brexit? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, I mean, I, I'd like to, <laughs> I mean, I'd like to know um, how this is all going to pan out as well. Um, from my perspective, um, what I see, and I think the UK is really trying to position itself is, um, it, it's out of the, the EU and it, it can really do what it wants. And it wants to be seen as that quite agile um, economy that is looking outwards is looking to do trade and business and attract business and money and people from around the world and I think it will we've seen this and and they will continue to really um, look to building and forging relationships with um, in partners particularly outside of the the EU and and those historic partnerships as well and I think you know there's that real um, historic link between um, you know, for good or bad, between the UK and Africa. And I think it will try and really, um, you know, hone in on that. And, you know, we've seen the, the new agreement between Kenya and the UK just, I think, last week. So I think there's real impetus to court, to, to attract um, businesses and individuals to the UK, whether that's to move, whether that's just to come and spend your money, buy property, buy businesses, or set up your businesses here. Um, and I think it will, uh, or I hope at least, will try and make things much easier for people to do that. Um, although disappointingly, we had our, our budget uh, last week and um, it was announced over the next um, five years, the uh, corporation tax rates will uh, increase from 19% to 25%. 
that's quite a big jump. But still, you know, the UK is competitive. Um, not what I'd have liked to have seen, but I mean, let's see. Um, and then we've got obviously the pandemic to throw into the mix as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hilesh, for joining us this afternoon. Um, should anyone wish to get in touch with you, how best can they reach you? Yeah, you can um, reach me um, by email. Uh, my, um, you can Google me, you'll find me on the Spencer West website. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, so please do follow me, join me. I'm on LinkedIn as well um, and Twitter. So um, whichever way you want to uh, get in touch, please do. Uh, always happy to have a conversation, answer questions and have a discussion. And, and particularly as we've discussed, you know, um, I, Africa is a really exciting, vibrant uh, place and it would be great to be able to work uh, with all of you to, you know, really help um, expand your businesses, grow your wealth, protect that. Um, I think the UK does have an interesting and important part to uh, play in that as well. So yeah, any questions, you know, uh, please do feel free to uh, come and speak to me uh, and message me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hilesh. Great, thank you.